On a rare night, near the end of the year, much like this one, in a snow-slumbering town so much like ours, let's call it so, there lived a child, so much like any of us are now or have been. Only, her name was Marie. But who am I, you may be asking yourselves? Who am I to tell you such a story on such a night? I am but a poor storyteller, who some might call Drosselmeyer. And I have traveled a long way along old roads to your cold town of Sudbury at Christmas time. A time of giving. But I have already given everything away. Everything but this little story about little Marie. Twas nearly Christmas what some still call the Yule. Whatever we may call it, tis the season to eat, drink, and be merry. Marie, despite her name, was not merry at all. In fact, she was completely miserable, and never more completely miserable than tonight. She lived in a small house on a dead-end street in Gatchel, where the sun rose for her twice each day, once in the morning, and once again at night, when the slag was poured fiery down the hill. Yet still, she was miserable. 
From which corner did such misery creep, you might ask? From every corner. From the very mines and tunnels beneath our feet right now. Up the misery came, scuttling on their crooked little claws. From the dim recesses of sleep she saw them, with chittering whiskers and long, wormy tails. There, right now in the shaking limbs of the Christmas tree. Nightmares! That's what Marie's mamma had told her it all was. Just a bad dream, just your imagination. Nobody would listen to Marie. And when she made her wish list, she put one thing on it. Magic. That would protect her from all the things under the Christmas tree. There's nothing under the tree except gifts, Marie, Mama said. Practical gifts, like dresses. I don't need dresses. I need magic, said Marie. You're far too old for silly things like that, said Mama. Magic isn't real. And so, the tree was packed to the brim with foil-wrapped packages and pretty bows containing all sorts of practical things, but nothing that mattered to Marie. But Marie mattered to me, old Drosselmeyer. And so I came, on that Christmas night, dragging my trunk with me, almost empty, but not quite. I didn't have anything practical at all. All I had was this. The paint is chipped. It looks used, said Mama. It's been loved, I told her. It's ugly. Its jaw is broken, she said. It's magic, I said. Is it? said Marie. No, it's not, said Mama. But it's just a toy. Magic isn't real. You see... Most of Marie's misery came from being told things like this. Get your head out of the clouds, Marie. Grow up, sit up, shut up, shape up, give up. No matter what words they used, that's what they were saying to her. Give up, Marie. Magic isn't real. So, Marie took the nutcracker and... If it felt warm in her hand, and if she felt, just for a moment, if she felt it moved, she ignored it. It was just a stupid toy. She tossed it on the floor at the foot of the bed. Go to sleep and dream practical dreams, called Mama. None of this nonsense about dancing sugar plums. You can see, then, why Marie might be determined to have... A very miserable Christmas. Marie dreamt strange dreams about a strange city and a strangely familiar child. This child was more miserable.
strange dreams about a strange city and a strangely familiar child. This child was more miserable than even Marie, and all alone, all locked up in a tower high above the city. Something had been stolen from them, and they needed help. Help me, Marie, they said. <gasps> Went Marie, waking up. What was that? Old houses make old noises. The creak of a floorboard, the groan of a stair. Very practical sounds. This was not a practical sound. This was a sound like the patter of little claws, the chatter of little teeth. Grow up, she told herself. None of it is real. But there was something very real clutched in her arms. She'd been holding it tight for comfort. That silly little toy I had given her. But how had it found its way into the bed? She'd thrown it on the floor. Could it have been... Well, never mind how. Why was she still holding this stupid toy with its little bits of pitch-black slag for eyes? It was old and ugly, just like Mama said. Or was it? The wooden jaw was cracked, and it hung open to one side. It must have hurt. It would have hurt if it was real. She took a ribbon from her dresser and tied it carefully around its head. Right away he looked better, less miserable, and so was she. What was that? Nothing. Everyone's asleep. Be practical, Marie. No. Something... Very much impractical was happening downstairs. So Marie picked up the nutcracker, and together they slipped out the bedroom door and crept slowly down the steps. Popping through pretty paper and bursting from boxes they came, muttering and menacing a massive mischief of mice. This was Marie's worst nightmares realized, her imagination spilling from her ears onto the carpet around her, those little claws, those little eyes, those little mouths with their sharp little teeth. Help! yelled Marie. But no one came. Upstairs, Mama rolled in her dreamless sleep and mumbled, Magic isn't real, just... Give up, the mice said, just... Grow up, Marie said to herself, shutting her eyes. Grow up and this will all go away. Grow up and... Just accept. Magic isn't... Never. Who said that? It came from Marie, although she didn't say it. It came muffled from within her arms, less like never and more like... Never. Never. Shouted the nutcracker again, his jaw all bound up in ribbon, leaping from Marie's arms onto the floor. Not a silly toy, but magic, said Marie. Meow, agreed the nutcracker, pulling a candy cane cutlass from his belt. Help, said the mice. The nutcracker's candy cane swung back and forth, puncturing couch cushions, ripping wallpaper, smashing vases. If someone didn't stop him, he might lay waste to all of Gatchel. Stop, said Marie. But still he went, toppling the tree. Stop! Up through the floor came a mouse. The largest mouse Marie had ever seen. It had three heads, and on each head was a crown. And each crown was smelted from the very nickel right below our feet. Devil's copper, it was called, and for good reason... Look what you've done, you silly child, said the devilish mouse king. The mess you've made. I'll be practical. I'll go up to bed, said Marie. Oh, it's far too late for that, said the mouse king, coming for her. But there was the valiant nutcracker leaping back into the fray. Silly toy, said the mouse king, swatting the nutcracker away. Marie watched as her defender teetered on the edge of a hole. Uh-oh, said the little nutcracker. Oh, no, said little Marie. 
Down you go, said the Mouse King, giving them a little push. Marie found herself on a pile of sand. It was like the beach at Ramsey Lake. herself on a pile of sand. It was like the beach at Ramsey Lake, only this beach went on and on in every direction with no lake in sight. And the sand was less coarse to the touch and darker. It almost looked like that awful stuff her mamma drank in the morning. Coffee, said Marie, sniffing it. Those fluffy clouds above her, the lollipop sun and... That stone laying on the ground right there looked too delicious to be a stone. Chocolate, she said, putting it to her lips. Yuck! She spit it out. It was sour. To wipe her mouth, she reached above her and grabbed a strand of cloud, which came away sticky like candy floss. Again, she couldn't resist. Yuck! 
said Marie. Ouch, said something from underneath her. Oh, she said, standing up to discover the little nutcracker had broken her long fall, and that her long fall had broken his little leg. I'm so sorry, she said. That mouse king was right. I've made such a mess. The nutcracker still couldn't speak, but he gestured in a way that seemed to say, I'm yours to break, Marie. But it's all my fault we're here, said Marie. And where are we anyway? The nutcracker shrugged as if to say, At least we're together, Marie. Coffee sand, chocolate stones, and candy clouds. This is more like dessert than a desert, Marie said. Mmm, the nutcracker groaned. Not sweet, you're right. Not anymore, said Marie. It's all gone sour. Marie was suddenly reminded of something. Or rather, of nothing. Of the great nothing that was her papa. Or rather had been papa. After he died, for months and months, every meal her and mamma sat down to eat in silence tasted like this. As if in echo, the candy floss clouds charred and blackened, and the lollipop sun melted and dripped. What's happening? said Marie. The nutcracker used his candy cane to trace an image in the sand. Three images, all the same. The Mouse King? said Marie, shivering. That's what's poisoned the land? The nutcracker nodded and then beckoned to her, limping away on his broken leg. Well, where are you going? said Marie, running to catch up. With you, Marie, the nutcracker limped to the end. And off they went, with no end in sight. What comes after the ending of the infinite, you might ask? What course follows dessert? A second. After the ending of the infinite, you might ask, what course follows dessert? A second helping, of course. Sweeter than an oasis, a candied castle rose up from the desert, with a caramel moat, gingerbread walls, and over it all loomed the tall spire of a sponge toffee tower. I need to get to that tower, said Marie, remembering her dreams of a strange city and a strangely familiar child. And so, the nutcracker led her, limping through the maze of deserted streets. Everything was quiet, and Marie noticed that every brick and paving stone in the city had been nibbled and gnawed, as if by thousands of sharp little teeth. At the foot of the tower was a once grand chateau. The chocolate orange dome collapsed and the cinnamon bark doors hanging open. It made Marie feel a sudden pang for her lonely little home in Gatchel. Despite the fact that she and Mama still lived there, it somehow felt emptier than this place. Marie and the Nutcracker snuck in through the doors into a large room. At the far end sat three marshmallow thrones, two of equal size with a smaller one in between. Beyond this lay the foot of the spiral staircase to the tower. 
silly child, said a familiar voice. Who said that, Marie said, spinning around. Silly, silly child, said another, deeper, deeply familiar voice. Who are you, said Marie. Who are you, said a third voice, this one more than familiar. I'm Marie, said Marie. So am I, said the third voice, familiar enough to be her own. Show yourself, said Marie. This has all been a silly child's game, said the first voice. It's time to grow up. The voices were the kind of familiar that's familial. The kind of voices you can recognize through closed doors and floorboards. Mama? said Marie. Listen to Mama, silly child, the second voice said. Be practical. There's no such thing as candy lands and talking nutcrackers. Papa, said Marie, thinking of his empty chair at the kitchen table. But you're... Come home, Marie, said the voice, and I'll be there waiting for you. How do I get back, said Marie. You just need to give up, said Mama. Give up, said Papa. Give up, said Marie though her lips didn't move. How easy it would be to listen, how easy to believe a lie and lie down. Never, said another voice, a distant one deep down inside Marie, in the glimmering part of her that still believed. What did you say? said the other three voices in unison. Never, said Marie. Never, said the nutcracker. Never mind, said the three voices as one, as three heads rose above the three thrones, and around them stepped the Mouse King, carrying not candy swords, but practical ones, the kind that can cut. <laughs> Marie could only watch as the broken nutcracker finally broke down, but not before he knocked off one of the crowns. The awful hunk of metal rolled across the floor to her feet. The Mouse King stepped over the nutcracker's body, three sets of red eyes staring and hungry. But then, two of those eyes, the two under the crownless head, blinked, changing from red to green. Green, the color of the leaves on the oak tree Papa planted in the backyard when she was born. Like Papa's eyes had looked when he came through the door after a long day to find her waiting for him. Happy. That's the way they looked. Then, the head started to fade. The two other heads watched it go. Claws reached up to grasp it, but it was too late. It was already gone. The four red eyes that swiveled back to her weren't hungry anymore. They were afraid. Leave me alone, the Mouse King said. Marie picked up the Nutcracker's arm. I give up, said the Mouse King, bumping into the thrones. I give in. I don't, said Marie, swinging the arm and knocking off another crown. Two red eyes became two blue ones. Blue like the sky above Delky Dozy 
when they'd lie on the grass in the field and Mama would point up and say, Keep your head up there, in the clouds, Marie. Never grow up. The head faded away. Don't, said the Mouse King, falling into the smallest throne. Don't hurt me. I won't, said Marie. I've only been hurting myself. And gently, she nudged the last crown off. Blue-green eyes. Her blue-green eyes. But not her miserable ones. The way they were. The way they could be. And as the final head faded, so too did the rest of the Mouse King, until all that was left were the three crowns. Marie ran to her nutcracker. She tore a piece of curtain and used it to bind his arm back to his side. But he couldn't move. He couldn't speak. He could only press one of the crowns into her hands and point towards the tower stairs. she went up and up and up. From her bedroom window back home, she could see the super stack, and Papa had once told her how his own Papa had brought him to the very top, and from up there you could see to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth felt far behind her now. The crown was so heavy in her hands, and finally she fell to her knees. Just a little rest she told herself. For someone so young as Marie, life had already seemed like one long continuous climb up an endless tower. It had not been fair to her, life, as it sometimes has not been fair to some of us. And if we have ever been miserable, as Marie had been, we cannot be blamed for forgetting as often as it can seem unfair that there are times if we let it, when everything just falls into place. When Marie opened her eyes, she found herself at the top of the tower. She'd arrived as if by magic. She was in a little round room with a glass prism in the center, like a lighthouse. 
Only instead of a lamp, there was a person within the prism. A very old person. Older, even, than old Drosselmeyer. Wake up, said Marie, reaching into the prism to shake the old one. <sighs> said the old one. What do you want? My friend is hurt and needs help, said Marie. I'm too old to help, said the old one. Never mind, said Marie. Where is the child in the tower that needs help? <sighs> the old one said, I'm too old to help. But I brought this magic crown for them, said Marie. Magic isn't real, said the old one. So Marie did what she seldom ever did, but what we all must do sometimes when we don't know what else to do. She sat down and cried. She cried and cried, more tears than grains of coffee in an endless desert, more tears than stairs in an endless toffee tower. Why are you crying? said the old one. I don't want to grow up, said Marie. Well, neither do I, said the old one. I want there to be magic, said Marie. I want that too, said the old one. But you are grown up, said Marie. Only on the outside, said the old one. But you don't believe in magic, said Marie. That's not how I feel on the inside, said the old one. I just need you to show me. Show you, said Marie. But all I have is this stupid crown. Magic, said the old one, reaching for it. Magic, said Marie, placing it upon their head. Like magic, wrinkles faded and eyes cleared to blue, and the aged old one became the ageless child they were. Like magic, the crown was no longer a hunk of nickel, but a bright, sugared plum. Now, said the sugar plum fairy holding Marie's hand, let's go help your friend. And like magic, they flew. Suddenly, the endless can feel too soon over. So simply, the ho-hum and humdrum can overflow with wonder. So swiftly, a fall can become flight. Marie and the sugar plum fairy flew down through a figgy pudding sky to find the poor nutcracker still where he lay, but more still than ever. Help him, said Marie. He's past help, said the sugar plum fairy. 
Please, said Marie, new tears springing to her eyes. Only magic can save him now, said the sugar plum fairy, placing one of the other crowns in Marie's hands. And no longer hoping, but believing, Marie slipped the crown over his little head. And would you believe what happened? Please believe. His broken joints mended, wood softened to flesh, and the crown burnished to gold on his head. And under it, his slag-black eyes glittered green up at Marie. My Marie, he said. And mine, said the sugar plum fairy. And taking her by each hand, they led her to sit on the smallest throne. And then they sat, too, on either side of her. And then together, they lifted the last crown. As it came down, Marie looked up. It was snowing. A flake hit her tongue. Icing sugar, she said, and so sweet. As sweet as the best of goodbyes, when you know on the other side of it, there will only be another hello.
Dear friends, end in the very place we thought we couldn't bear at the beginning, home. Up here, on the very rare and shortest days of the year, like tonight, when the wind howls and the snow blows, home can and must be a most magical place. And on a night like tonight, it was just such a place as this to which Marie returned, no longer a house and a haunted one at that, but a home, again, as it had once been. There she was in her bed. There was her nutcracker, the one I'd given to her, tucked under one arm, freshly painted and mended. Not some silly toy, but a friend. And there goes Marie, bounding down the stairs. And there was Mamma, waiting for her, as parents wait for their children, waiting as children themselves and they might have whispered some magic words like, I love you, or Merry Christmas. But then Mama said, What's that on your head? And Marie reached up and touched it. A bit of colored paper in a ring. It's a crown, said Marie. So it is, said Mama, lifting Marie up so she could place it on top of the tree. And even once it was off, Marie could feel another crown there atop her head, invisible, but there all the same. Magic, said Marie. Magic, said Mama. Magic, says old Drosselmeyer, here at the very end of the story. And now I must go, leaving you with this rare night in your snow slumbering town. For I still have a long way to travel, along old roads, and a story or two left to give. Mm -hmm. 